In his 2002 book, Consumers in the Country, Ronald R. Klein writes about perhaps the first form of social media in the United States, and it involves barbed wire. In rural America in the 20th century, it took a long time for phone lines to be extended, the phone lines we recognize now, to very rural and remote areas. So farmers and ranchers who didn't want to have to wait, and reasonably so, realized that this barbed wire could carry an electrical signal. It literally was a line that extended miles and miles and miles along ranches, along roads, before Ma Bell ever set up a phone line. And connecting these barbed wires, the top line usually, to a phone, they would have a party line. There could be only one signal that would be sent up and down the line, anyone could tap into it, and often people did. There are tales of people running the batteries out on their telephones because they are listening to music that someone else down the line is sharing. Uh, for As Ronald R. Klein documents, this is perhaps the first music sharing social media in the United States. This also created a different kind of community when there were important events, such as the declaration of World War II, or fires spreading down the line, people would share this information. Uh, it was collective. It was not individual one-to-one. -one. It was one-to-many and many-to-one, back and forth along a barbed wire. When we speak of online activities, we should recognize its origin in that original barbed wire. Similarly, when we talk about pinning to a board or a bulletin board service, we should recognize the physical analog that preceded it. In regular day-to-day -day interaction, we often think about unmediated communication. I can directly speak to you, you can directly speak to me, we're in the same room, we can come to some shared understanding. Uh, behind me is a public library. That library contains, on the other hand, a good amount of mass media. This is a form of communication in which one person writes down something, or perhaps records a video, or makes an, a sound recording and that recording then can be sent out to many people, viewed by many people at once. Uh, a medium is a form through which communication is possible. Uh, and a mediated communication uses a medium. Social media is different than a mass media communication, like a video or a library, in that it is possible for communication to happen back and forth in two directions, between two groups, between two people, across space, and sometimes across time. Now, you'll notice I said when I was out by the barbed wire that perhaps, perhaps, that was the first form of social media because, of course, we've been social for a very long time. Our talk has long been uh, non-mediated, face-to-face, but we might say the first form of social media in which we had mediated communication, mediated by some form, was the letter in which people were sending information to one another, either by messenger or later by post office. Uh, we first get online before we use words. We use uh, dits and dots in Morse code in telegraphs in the 1830s. It's only when we get to the 1870s that we get to the telephone and the party line uh, with music sharing over barbed wire. After that point, we get to something called the ARPANET in the 70s and the BitNet 
the, which is the ARPANET extended to universities in the 1980s, before at the end of the 1980s and the beginning of the 1990s we get to the internet. And that's when social content really blossoms. I just said a lot. Let's talk about the movement uh, after the telephone from the ARPANET to the internet. This is a logical map, not geographically uh, realistic, but nevertheless geographically organized of a set of connections between universities, defense stations, and uh, like the Pentagon, uh, to send out information. You can see that there are multiple ways for each node to communicate to another node. And there's a purpose for that. There's a bit of an urban legend, and it's never been proven, that ARPANET was designed in order to uh, accommodate the possibility of nuclear explosions. Uh, that hasn't been proven, but one thing that is clearly true here and is a strong defense feature of this information network, originally designed in the 1970s for universities and defense to communicate in the case of disasters, is that it is possible for all of these centers to communicate even if one node is taken out, or even, indeed, many nodes are taken out. The structure of the ARPANET, which stands ARPA stands for Advanced Research Project Agency of the Defense Department of your United States government. It represents the same structure of the internet today in which there are multiple ways for an information packet to get from say MIT at your upper right over uh, at your upper left over to Hawaii or down to Stanford many, many ways for that information packet to get there, so that if it is stopped somewhere by a network outage or a nuclear explosion, it can be rerouted elsewhere and the communication can go through safely. This is today's internet map. Uh, the Opta project at opte.org will contain uh, updated graphs of the internet. Uh, this is a current routing map of the world communication network. Uh, you'll notice there are certain colors. Europe, the Middle East, Central Asia, and Africa are green. Uh, you'll notice that North America is blue. Uh, Asia and Pacific regions are red. And you'll notice there's a lot of traffic within color, although there's some between color. And there are some unknown locations, which are white. What percentage of the population is currently online communicating? Uh, it's really high in North America. In fact, the highest in the world, 78.6%, a little lower in Europe. Uh, still high in Australia. The rest of the world, it's somewhat lower. But even in sub-Saharan Africa, where there's a great deal of poverty, more than one in 10 uh, people, as of the end of last year, were online and communicating. Internet adoption in the United States is uh, reaching a plateau, mostly because it really can't go that much higher. It certainly can't rise at the rate that it was uh, rising in the early 1990s when year after year after year you would add 5%. We can't clearly do that without hitting 100%. And there will always be some people who don't use a technology for reasons of health, for reasons of ability, for reasons of remoteness, or for reasons of choice. Uh, this is becoming a near ubiquitous technology as of August of last year. A uh, source here is the Pew Internet and American Life uh, Project Survey which is a great place to go back to if you would like to take a look at adoption rates as time proceeds. Now, what kind of connection are we talking about here? Back at the turn of the century, when we start the 21st century, 
For most Americans who were online, this meant a dial-up connection. There are many of you for whom the sound of a squelching uh, dial-up tone across a phone connection is a thing of the past. Many of you have never heard that tone, having come online in the middle of the last decade. As you can see from June 2000 to August 2011, the percentage of home broadband connections out of all connections has come to be nearly ubiquitous. If we also look back at 2000 and the first half of the last decade, you could see a small but persistent gender gap in internet usage with more men, slightly more men, but significantly more men than women using the internet. Uh, over the last few years, that has become an inconsistent result and often uh, a contradicted result. It looks as though men and women are using the internet now roughly comparably. Last year's Pew Internet and American Life Tracking Survey also tells us, though, that there are some strong trends that persist. Young people use the internet far more often than older people. Those with a lot of income use it a great deal more than those with less than $30,000 of income per year. College graduates, of, hope I, of whom I hope you will become one soon, use the internet much more than those who have not graduated from high school. If the internet is useful, those who are making use of it are the highly educated, uh, the uh, high income, and the young. What are we using the internet for? Those of us who use the internet, which is almost 80%. We use it to send and read email, which is the new analog of the old form of social media, the letter. We use search engines. We watch videos. These are common. Almost as common is the use of a social networking site like Facebook. Uh, very uncommon as of last year, if you look down at the bottom, was writing your own blog, writing your own web page, or using Twitter. These are becoming much more common, but a social networking site like Facebook is five times as common as of last year. The progression of social content on the internet has quickly moved beyond the old bulletin board, of which I'll show you one in, in a moment, to web pages that someone writes themselves, to blogs, and now to social media mega sites within the last half of a decade. It seems like Facebook has been around forever, but it really hasn't. This is what a bulletin board system used to look like on the internet when the internet was around, but World Wide Web pages were not. You would type into a, a, a terminal and you were lucky if it had some colors on it. Most often it was monochromatic, meaning just black and white or amber and white or green and white. And you would have conversations with somebody. You would get to know who they were. You would set up a relationship and then you would start to send messages. If you were really lucky, you would find a Usenet group which is uh, still around. It's a set of groups organized by interest uh, to which people would post comments and then people would post, like you would post on a bulletin board, a response to the first comment. That seems like a long time ago, but it wasn't that long. Less than 30 years. If you're interested in hearing about how we move from these bulletin board systems to the modern form of Facebook and Twitter, social media that we have today, I really encourage you to listen to a BBC podcast series called The Secret History of Social Networking. It's about an hour and 30 minutes, but it's really interesting. So the next time you have to drive somewhere an hour and 30 minutes, say from, you know, Augusta over to Bangor or, uh, you know, Bangor to just about any place else, take a listen. Listen to it in your car. Uh, you'll find out a lot of really interesting details, including what the well is. Look up the well 
and, and, and look it up with reference to the words whole earth. You might be surprised. So if a web page is simple HTML code, that stands for Hypertext Markup Language, the way that we create links on a simple web page, a blog is a particular kind of web page. A blog is a web page featuring approved authors who on that website have the privilege of writing a long form article, but it's a social form because it allows comments on that article to which the author often then responds beginning a conversation after the posting of the full article. You'll often see now, although mainstream journalists have denigrated bloggers, you'll often see newspaper uh, articles online having a comment section, essentially turning newspapers online into blogs. A social media mega site like Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn or Pinterest is a web page too. Uh, but it goes beyond the step that blogs go to, where you, you can comment on somebody's authorized post privileging an author, to a much more democratic system in which everybody who signs up for an account is able to post, is able to comment on one another's posts, and is able to share somebody else's post in their own stream, in their own area. It's a very democratic form which is almost exactly where bulletins board started from, minus the sharing features, and also minus the what's called monetization, the ability of the groups that are hosting the social media to make a buck off of it. Let's think about blogs a little bit as a form of social media before we move on to these social media mega sites. Uh, Lada Adamic of the University of Michigan and also uh, Hewlett Packard, along with Natalie Glantz in 2005, looked backward to the 2004 election, two election cycles ago now. And they wrote a paper called The Political Blogosphere and the 2004 U.S. Election. Divided they blog, they wrote. And this picture that you see is taken from their paper. If the year 2000 was the year when the colors red for Republicans and blue for Democrats first became cemented in our culture, in America, uh, in the year 2004, the political blog first came into force. You'll notice that the blue dots here, they're blue blogs, uh, are about equal in number to the red dots, the red blogs. You'll also note that here we have a spring embedding uh, sociogram. You'll notice that most of the blogs that refer to other blogs are referring to other blogs of the same political persuasion. Links to another blog are only reciprocated about a quarter of the time. So you have a lot of unidirectional references as well. The yellow links in the middle here are relatively rare, and they are the cross-partisan references. And they're relatively rare. Blue edges are uh, Democratic to Democratic blog conversations. Red edges are Republican to Republican conversations. Lada Adamic and Natalie Glantz find that the blogosphere is divided just as uh, our political offline culture is divided. We can look a little bit closer to home and we can find evidence of partisanship in the Maine State Senate in the year 2011. This is uh, an example of uh, a network defined by action, not by reference online. Uh, this is co-sponsorship of bills in the main state senate. Uh, co-sponsorship is an act that is a social, and it occurs through an offline social medium, which is the bill. Uh, you write your name to a bill, and you indicate your formal support for it.
So it's an old form of social media within a legislature. Uh, the blue individuals are Democratic senators. The red individuals are Republican senators. Senator Woodbury is uh, a nonpartisan senator in the spring of 2011. And you'll find that with the exception of Senator Schneider, uh, overwhelmingly the co-sponsorships seem to be uh, within party. Senator Schneider in the spring embedding is so firmly aligned with the Republicans that she ends up being moved in, in the spring embedding uh, visualization technique over with the Republicans. Uh, but while uh, Senators Diamond, Sullivan, Hobbins, and Hill have some connections with Republicans, uh, Hill through Woodbury, it's not enough to bring them over to the Re Republican camp. Most of the co-sponsorships they have are with other Democrats. And consistently, with the small exception of Senator Cates of Augusta, uh, there's really very little bipartisan activity by Republican senators, except with uh, Democratic Senator Schneider. This is an offline social medium that looks very much like the online social medium described by Adamic and Glantz in their paper. If we move back online and we move beyond blogs and we think about what are now called social networks simply, but I, I want to remind you are just a subset of what social networks can be, the online social networks, the social media mega sites, these are perhaps your arguably six biggest. Each one has a different emphasis and each one takes a different format. Facebook is a place for sharing across various media. Uh, you can do photos, that's common. Uh, you can share words and articles. You can share videos. Uh, you can share apps and app results, game results. The, the emphasis is on an emotional sharing, an expressiveness with one's friends and one's family, sometimes one's co-workers, but often work is not discussed there. LinkedIn, on the other hand, uh, is almost wholly limited to workship relationships. Uh, your boss, your subordinates, your colleagues, your managers, people you've worked with that are outside your company, people you hope to work with in the future, and it's a very professional discussion, often containing uh, information about job openings, resumes, and in the academic world, curriculum vitae, which are essentially resumes, but we like to use longer words. Google Plus is very much like Facebook, except that it um, prioritizes text. It allows an individual to write paragraph after paragraph after paragraph without being cut off, unlike Facebook. And it also allows you to send information out to particular circles very easily. Everybody you have uh, connected to in Google+, as you know if you've engaged in a conversation with me, you or can organize into a circle, like a circle for a class or a circle for a university you attend a separate circle for friends, a separate circle for family, send different messages to different circles, and you can fairly segregate the kind of content you have. It could be emotional, it could be professional. It often tends to be geeky, uh, technical information uh, that attracts Google Plus users. Twitter, on the other hand, is very compact, 140 characters or less. That's essentially a newspaper headline. If you can't say it like you could say it in a headline, it doesn't belong on Twitter. So what often has tended to happen is that there will be a short headline and then a small link. Twitter also allows you to very compactly refer to other statements made by other people or to retweet them, to share them, which is a common feature of social media. Pinterest gets even less wordy than Twitter. It shares pictures, 
sometimes videos, but mostly pictures. The pictures are huge, and you might have a very small amount of text underneath, almost like a caption now. And the picture is the thing on Pinterest. For Reddit, uh, you have a, a service that's a little bit like Twitter, but it concentrates on newspaper articles that you might have read, scientific articles that you might have read, uh, and it sends out the headline with the ability for people to make comments on it below. Uh, and also to rate up or rate down the story to make it appear higher in this kind of online newspaper that people create, a clipping service, or to be knocked down lower. For these different forms, and I, I've picked five, I've used the uh, service Alexa.com to take a look at which ones are big and which ones are small. The first kind of rating for bigness that we can uh, get is the traffic rank, where one is the single uh, biggest traffic site on the entire internet. You notice Facebook, the blue line, has actually hit that mark a couple of times. And it has hit it more as we get toward the uh, current days in 2012. It always seems to be quite close. Uh, shortly behind that, you know, close to around number 10, is Twitter. Uh, below that is LinkedIn. LinkedIn doesn't have as many users as Twitter does, but it has a lot of activity among those who use it. Reddit is, is down on this logarithmic scale, you notice, down at about the hundredth biggest site. And Pinterest started from nowhere in 2011. Hardly anyone had heard of Pinterest. And now uh, Pinterest has really risen very quickly uh, to overtake Reddit and start to threaten LinkedIn as a pretty major uh, social networking website, a social media mega site that only requires pictures or video to share. Another measure that we can take is how sticky social media might be. By stickiness, I mean how liable is someone to bounce off it? Do people just head over to a social media site and spend a little time there and then leave? Or do they spend a lot of time on there? Now it turns out, if we look at the same source, Alexa.com, that on Facebook, uh, this is yesterday, the typical user spent 25 minutes and 23 seconds on Facebook. Might not sound like much until you consider that's almost half of an hour and there are only 24 hours in the day. For those who used Facebook, they stayed there a lot. Uh, people stuck around on Reddit less than half the time. Uh, people stayed on Twitter for a third of the time that they did stayed on Facebook. LinkedIn and Pinterest, even a little bit less. Facebook seems to be the place that we stay, uh, where we stay, and that we check and recheck and recheck. Some of you may be familiar with this. It's a place that seems to be the most... Uh, sticky uh, uh, in, among the social media outlets. We can use Twitter uh, as a particular social media form to do more than express ourselves in headlines, to share information, to share links, to respond to others. We can also use Twitter, uh, unlike Facebook, which is somewhat private in what it presents, we can use Twitter as a search engine. We can use it to profile politics and political groups. Uh, we can figure out when a political movement that presents itself as grassroots is really grassroots, and when it might actually not have as much of a grassroots flavor as it says it does. In the parlance of grassroots organization, that's called astroturf. Fake grassroots. How could we do that? Well, let me show you two pictures of political movements. Here's one uh, from the beginning of this year, and it was from the social movement Occupy. There were two activities happening, happening protests happening in Washington, D.C. on the 14th and 15th uh, of uh, 2012. They were called Occupy the Dream. This was getting ready for Martin Luther King Day and Occupy Congress. Um, these weren't very successful movements in the sense of getting large groups of people together, but what they were successful in doing is getting a lot of people talking about it. Uh, each of these nodes you'll see here, 
and this is generated from Node XL, by the way, is a Twitter account. And each tie is a retweet of somebody else, what someone else said, or a mention of another account while saying something about Occupy the Dream or Occupy Congress using those two hashtags at the top, you'll see. A hashtag is a number sign before a term. Or it's a reply to what someone else has already written. That's not simply a retweet, but is uh, adding something to the conversation. Each of the boxes here represents kind of one cluster, a set of people who are communicating with one another. You notice there are a lot of clusters of varying sizes, all having cohesive conversations and yet also communicating with one another in various forms. It's pretty cool. There's a lot of communication going on. It's happening across many different forms. There's no one center, although there are some areas that in groups that are larger and smaller. Uh, everybody seems to be communicating with everybody. That's the image that's classic of grassroots. From the bottom, no one big leader emerges, but a lot of individual shoots of grass connected with one another through a root system, together acting. On the other hand, also this year, you may have heard of a group that was referring to itself as a grassroots movement called Americans Elect. And there were Twitter posts regarding Americans Elect as well. Here, ties are also mentions, replies, retweets, uh, happening on the same day. Americans Elect was trying to run its own presidential candidate. There were very few people talking about Americans Elect. Those who were, like Dave Weigel, uh, Daily Coase, tended to be bloggers. Some people, like Americans Elect, were uh, engaged in the conversation and driving conversation themselves. There were a number of people who were isolated with one another in their Twitter conversations about Americans Elect. Did you notice here that they're isolated? Many, many, many more people isolated than connected to one another. There are just a few centers of conversation. Most of them are either big bloggers or part of the media. And uh, there's not much going on there. This is a sign of a movement that is not quite as grassroots as it might portray itself to be through the mass media. I'd like to finish this video segment by talking about another uh, Twitter network, one that I began tracking using NodeXL in December 4th of 2011 and that's the Twitter account for the University of Maine at Augusta, the university through which you're taking this class. Now a tie here refers to following. So in December of 2011, there were few enough accounts following the University of Maine at Augusta, or which the University of Maine at Augusta itself was following, that I could look up who these Twitter accounts were. I could try to research where they were coming from, identify them, and say, oh, I know that's a student. Wait, I know that's a staff member. There were just two staff members engaged in a following relationship with the University of Maine at Augusta. There was uh, only, uh, among faculty, only one who was following that account. Uh, that was me at the time. Uh, a couple of other educational institutions, a few PR people, and some people who I couldn't identify or figure out at the time. This is a small town kind of communication. And Charles Caleb Colton once said, if you want to be known but not know about the larger world, move to a small town. UMA's Twitter network started as a small town. What you'll see next is how it's grown over the next year. And this is part of what's happened to Twitter over the last year uh, and social media. It's growing exponentially in its connectivity.
both in its degree, how many people it connects to, and in how connected UMA's altars are to one another. The spring of 2012. I used here a spiral uh, form of visualization uh, and also asked Node XL to identify groups that are highly connected to one another. Boom, we've all of a sudden got a big city. The University of Maine at Augusta is suddenly tied to dozens of accounts. And these dozens of accounts are in a number of different contexts. The folks in the green area over at the left are engaged in um, public relations activity. There's still some other educational institutions. These are the yellow groups down at the bottom. And there's a group within the university itself that is paying attention to what the University of Maine at Augusta is announcing. It's becoming more functional as a mechanism for building the intellectual academic community at the university itself. All of a sudden, we've got a big city in which there are a lot of messages going out, information about what University of Maine at Augusta is doing to the rest of the world, other PR groups in Maine, newspapers, other educational institutions are finding out about what UMA is doing through Twitter. But who are these individuals? All of a sudden, it's too many for me to track. It's too many for me to nail down exactly who's a professor, who's a student, uh, where the PR people are. I, I look and I can find a few, but I can't identify every one anymore. And now we know the other half of Charles Caleb Colton's saying, which is that if you want to know but not be known as a person, that is, you want to know a lot of things, but perhaps be a little bit more anonymous, move to a big city. University of Maine at Augusta has become a big city. And just wait until we move to the fall. Now we have 115 nodes in the system, uh, moved beyond dozens to over 100. There are 1,042 following ties in this network. We're lucky that between the spring and the fall, a technical innovation in NodeXL has arisen, which is tied bundling. If you go to graph options, uh, when you create a graph, it, it looks like a palette. Click that icon and then look for options under the Edges tab. One of those is bundling. And as I mentioned in our last week of lecture, one of the things bundling does is it draws together ties that are moving from one area of a graph all together to another area of a graph. So that in the meantime, uh, you can kind of see the width of it, but it allows other directions of graphs to be seen, uh, directions of edges, excuse me, to be seen moving from one area to another. So that you can begin to get an idea of where the main areas of connection are. What are the really big groups here? Here you can see three. Uh, one is centered around the University of Maine at Augusta itself. Uh, University of Maine at Augusta, Kate's Library, UMA Student Life, uh, the people who run the website, a number of professors, a number of students. Then there are some uh, nonprofit groups down at the bottom, MOFCA, uh, which is an organic association, University of Maine Extension classes, which are non-academic classes that are, are, are helping people learn things in agriculture, uh, and industry gaining skills, the Maine news feed, uh, and yes, McDonald's, Maine McDonald's. Apparently, we're loving it. Uh, up at the top, on the right, you see newspapers, television station, uh, history people, uh, all together in another area. They're all talking to one another, and they have a major connection to those nonprofit groups and a smaller but significant trunk of connection to UMA itself. It's become a lot bigger, and thank goodness that NodeXL has allowed us to bundle the ties together. You'll also notice in this graph that you can scarcely see some nodes, and they're anonymous. They're not labeled. 
uh, the labels that appear are for those groups that have an in degree of at least 20, that has have at least 20 other accounts referring to them, like UMA Student Life or the Cates Library, or MOFCA. You'll also see some images. Those images will appear for accounts that are highly central, with a particular kind of centrality, eigenvector centrality. You've read about eigenvector centrality, and I won't expect you to master the concept, but think about it this way. Uh, you have a high eigenvector centrality if you are connected to a lot of people who are also connected to a lot of people. If you're not just tied to a lot of people, but tied to a lot of popular people, a lot of people who are liked over Twitter, who are followed over Twitter, then you have a high eigenvector centrality. University of Maine at Augusta is one of these. Bangor Daily News is another one of those. Uh, the Maine News Feed and University of Maine Extension is yet another one. The node size is proportional to in degree, so that these are the ones that we know are getting a lot of popularity, and who are they getting a lot of uh, uh, ties from? They're getting a lot of ties from, they're getting followed by the people who are followed by others. These are the influencers in this network, and that's why you can see their image, and that's also uh, uh, why you can see their names down at the bottom most of the time. <laughs>